Good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Rao Govindaraju. I go by GS, and I'm the head of the Lyle School of Civil Engineering. And it is my pleasure today to introduce Jinha Jong. By the way, I didn't get the memo about having to suit up, but I see Jinha is appropriately addressed for this occasion. Uh, congratulations, Jinha, on the promotion. Really well deserved. Uh, Jinha got his uh, undergraduate and master's degree from Seoul National University and came to Purdue for his PhD. So he's one of our own. He got his PhD in 2011. And after that, he did a stint as a postdoc at University of Illinois in Chicago. And then he went to Texas A&M, where he was a faculty member for several years. And then we were able to you know, recruit him and bring him back to, bring him back to Purdue. So Jinha works in uh, what I would call uh, the interface between geomatics engineering and natural sciences. Uh, he, he works in remote sensing, high performance computing. He works with uh, US, uh, US systems. He does something called high throughput phenotyping, which we will let him explain. Uh, he has, in fact, uh, done uh, quite a bit of that at Texas, uh, following uh, some of that at Purdue. One of the things that uh, you may be familiar with is the state's Indiana's LIDAR database, which many of us use for research, is actually something that is spearheaded by Jinha and his work. So he also sort of manages that for us. So with that, Jinha, I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, GS, for great introduction. And uh, it's my honor to be here to present uh, my journey, how I got here. And um, I'm going to borrow your next 10 minutes to talk about my journey. And uh, trust me, I'm not going to take any technical detail about any of my research. So that uh, it's going to be a little bit more entertaining. So I'm from originally South Korea. And uh, I was born in the city called Naju, because you know, that's the city where my parents met and I get married. And after that I was born, and my parent was an elementary school teacher, so he got a job in an uh, island called Noha Island. So we moved there, so I lived there for until when I was three. Then my uh, dad got a job in Gwangju City, so we moved there. So I stayed there for my teenagers, went to elementary school, middle school, and high school, etc. And by this time, this is the size of the world that I know. I know in geography, you know, the world is much larger than this, but intuitively, this is the world that I know. And after that one, there is you know, the chance where my world gets a little bit you know, larger. And you know, after high school, I went to Seoul National University to you know, study in college. And I majored in something called the Civil Urban Jewish System Engineering Department over there. So you know, as probably all you did as a freshman, uh, especially in South Korea, you're in a high school, in a K-12 education is tough, so tough. And uh, I was doing, I, had, I was having a lot of fun. I did a lot of crazy things. <laughs> not going to school, you're not, not going to the final. Some of the semester I got you know, a couple of apps, and et cetera, you know, away from my parents, and et cetera. So I did so many crazy things, but uh, one of the crazy things that I did during my undergrad study was actually you know, traveling to Europe. Just you know, bought an airplane ticket and Europass for one month. I didn't book anything, just didn't you know, leave uh, without booking any hotel, without knowing where to go. And that this was the moment where I realized that, hey, actually there's a lot bigger world than South Korea out there. And after this one, of course, it was tough because I was you know, under budget, no plan. <laughs> suffered a lot. But I realized that, hey, I like to study abroad. I like to explore what is out there. So I just came back and uh, consulting with my seniors, and uh, I like to study abroad. You know, where to go? You know, what kind of option do I have? And uh, at that time, I was you know, pursuing a faculty position in South Korea, and all my seniors you know, telling me that you need to do your you know, master degree in South Korea if you like to come back. Otherwise, you're not going to have any chance. So that's what I did. And I just did my master degree here at the, you know, the Seoul National University. My advisor is in Hyeongdong Park over there. I did my master degree in developing GIS application for uh, you know, borehole you know, the management system over there. And after finishing my master, 
I traveled all the way to you know, Purdue to start my PhD. And at that time, these are the fact members in geomatics engineering. Uh, I'm gonna say that about three of them retired, and actually you know, four of them retired, but uh, I, I was you know, feeling very lucky to you know, meet them to start my uh, you know, PhD journey. And 2007, I joined the lab in you know, Lars, you know, Dr. Crawford over here, I met her, and I joined the group and I did my PhD in data fusion between full wave and LiDAR in hyperspectral process application. Basically, how to combine those two data sets, how to just extract information out of it, how to utilize high performance computing for those kind of complex data set. After that one, I started my postdoc at UIC, you know, working with uh, you know, Brian Pizanowski from here at Purdue, you know, working with the LiDAR and uh, you know, Soundscape you know, at the time to study you know, nature. Then in 2013, I had opportunity to come back to Purdue, working with Dr. Crawford again as a postdoc at the time, and working with the data fusion of the LiDAR and hyperspectral, but also another fun project was uh, developing this UAV or you know, drone for hyperspectral. At that time, you know, we all know that DJI is you know, dominating the market at the time. I mean, right now, but at the time, you know, DJI was a kind of small company. They just had a DJI panel one or something like this. So. We work with a you know, company in Brazil, this you know, yellow airplane over there. They brought this in you know, a frame all the way here in West Lafayette. And uh, it was so big, you cannot hand launch it. So we have to mount it on top of the car, which is, you know, by the way, Dr. Crawford's in a personal car over there with the manual sticks. And I was the only one who can drive manual sticks, so I was the driver. <laughs> you don't see me in the picture, but uh, you see that Dr. Crawford is right next to it. And uh, it was a great experience to expose you know, something new. In 2014, I had the opportunity to move to Texas. I got a position in Texas A&M in Corpus Christi. This is beautiful campus on an island. I still remember every time I drove you know, to my you know, office, I see the you know, beautiful ocean. It is very uh, relaxing, uh, unless you have a you know, hurricane, of course. You know, we had a Hurricane Harvey hit that you know, area, so I have to evacuate. That is another story. But at that time, uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi was uh, you know, designated as one of the six UAB test sites by FAA. And uh, it was in you know, a very competitive you know, process. And you know, Texas A&M Corpus Christi got one of them. And the, the university was pushing UAB as uh, one of the major you know, research you know, trusts at the time. So I knew that I had to be part of it. And also, you know, 2015, Texas A&M got our, um, one of the DOE RPE grant. And uh, there's two awardees nationwide. One was in a Texas A&M, the other one was Purdue. And uh, was, uh, you know, we were kind of in you know, competitors you know, at the time. So I started work with you know, at the UAB based in high throughput phenotype, which is in a basic major in the plant, working on this. And uh, I didn't realize that uh, I'm going to be working on this area all my career in Texas A&M for the next, in effect, in the next five years. You know, expert, you know, utilizing my expertise in geomatics and remote sensing and high performance computing and et cetera, and helping this you know, challenging problem with the agriculture. So you know, work with that in you know, the topic for you know, the last five years. My program was going pretty strong. And uh, I had a, you know, three postdocs at the time, and a one PhD student, one master's degree you know, student. Uh, here at Purdue, there is not a big group, but the, the campus that I was in, this was one of the largest you know, programs that I was running. And uh, funding was good as well, but uh, there is always something in my mind that I don't understand what it was. And uh, now I remember, now I now I can explain why it was. But uh, you know, this is the photos that I found from the Google. You know, salmon always like to come back to the place where you're born. <laughs> Do you know why? Because salmon comes back to the stream where they're born because they know it is a good place to spawn. They won't waste time looking for streams with good habitat and other salmon. Purdue was like that for me. And I remember when I first came here for an interview, uh, I really envied this in a geomatics program. Because in Texas A&M, I was running the program that has nothing to do with the geomatics. But the here, I can just you know, to build my own program that's going to be strong in my core area, and that, that gives me the reason why I need to come back. So in 2019, 
I just, you know, here for the interview, and I got an offer, decided to come back. This was in a three-day drive, all the way from, you know, South Texas, all the way to, you know, West Lafayette. So starting my position in 2019, it was great. See all those, you know, new students, but you know that what happened in 2020, COVID started. There's nobody at school. And uh, this is a beginning, you know, stage of my career where I need to build my network. And that uh, this was brutal. Because you know, I cannot meet anybody. And I cannot develop any collaboration. And uh, it was tough at the beginning, but uh, soon realized that, you know, there's uh, other ways of doing it. Uh, by the way, this is uh, all the setup. You know, this is uh, my desk in my office right now. And you see the, you know, the camera in the middle, the monitors that monitor in how my and my look on the screen, you know, double screen and the, you know, the uh, audio, you know, mixers, you know, the video switcher so that I can go back in between my screen and et cetera. So, you know, it was in a great uh, opportunity for me to, you know, develop, you know, my online presence, you know, using this as an opportunity. And we also uh, did an you know, undergraduate study and you know, undergraduate teaching where this is you now Radhika. She was uh, one of the teaching, uh, life teaching fellow where she's teaching in you know, a demonstration where we are you know, live streaming you through the YouTube live over there. 109 students is you know, joining over there. There's about you know, 20, 30 students in person because they're you know, operating in a hybrid mode over there. And uh, with that, I think uh, we've been doing pretty good. And I just you know, came up with uh, this kind of you know, mission statement, I'm going to say, you know, that uh, our lab named this in you know, a special data science lab aims to innovate, enrich, and synthesize geospatial data science for solving challenging problems by leveraging our expertise. So I think we are doing you know, pretty well in this area. And uh, I'm not only coming back to Purdue, not only I was able to work with uh, you know, the agriculture in you know, disciplines, but now I can diversify. I can work with the forestry, and you know, now I'm part of the digital forest initiative. Uh, I'm doing a lot of collaboration over there. And uh, not only the you know, the natural object. I can, you know, have a chance to work with a non-natural object, concrete, you know, asphalt core you see over there. And also, you know, the get involved with the Aspire project or, you know, the uh, connected vehicle and the uh, electric uh, charging system on the road is, you know, being part of the, you know, the core you know, area as well. And I'd like to end my presentation with a quote that I found online, which kind of aligns very well with my experience and uh, where I want to be. And 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the one that you did. So throw up your ball in a bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade wind in yourself, explore, dream, and discover. And I think that's what I want to do for the rest of my career. And uh, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes to thank my collaborators who helped me to get here. These are the collaborators from the Texas A&M system over there, and I also like to, you know, thank my collaborators within the civil engineering department, and also, you know, other uh, uh, faculties from, you know, other areas. And I also like to thank uh, my student who graduated from my program, and uh, always, you know, the first one is uh, special. My first one was, uh, you know, Dr. A.J. Chang, and uh, he started uh, my program when I was in Texas A&M. Uh, he was the only one that I have at the time. No funding, anything. He been through everything with me. I would like to thank him. Now he's a faculty member in Tennessee State University. My second postdoc was in you know, Dr. Jun Ho Yam, and uh, he's now as a faculty member in South Korea, Gyeongsang National University. And uh, my third postdoc was in you know, Dr. Oh. He's actually sitting here right now. And uh, he helped me transition from Texas to you know, Purdue over there, over here. And uh, now he is a computational infrastructure specialist at the Institute of you know, Plant Science here at Purdue. My first PhD student, uh, Dr. Akash Ashapre, and uh, he was also very special because he was not recruited by me. He was recruited by some other faculty member in Texas A&M, but he happened to join my group and moved all the way here at Purdue and uh, you know, graduated here from Purdue. Now he's working at NASA. I'd like to thank my current uh, uh, research group members. Uh, some of them are sitting here. I believe some of them are joining online as well. And uh, my family, uh, this is my brother and sisters and uh, my parents, and uh, my brother and sister's family, 
I also like to thank uh, my parents-in-law and uh, uh, really thank them. And uh, I'd like to uh, especially thank you know, three persons who helped me greatly for me to get here. And uh, those three, I am not listing them by any importance or anything, just you know, by cross order that I met. First one is you know, Dr. Ed Mikhail. He was the one, he's now retired, but he was the one who taught me all those geomatics engineering when I first came here. I didn't know anything about geomatics engineering. I like to call him my father in geomatics. My advisor, Dr. Crawford, I still believe when we first met, at the time when she joined Purdue as part of the Dream Hire, I was looking for my advisor, and that she, you know, you believed in me, gave me an opportunity to join your group. And without that, I'm not going to be here. Really, thank you. And the uh, last person that I'd like to thank is uh, Dr. Juan Landbar. He is a uh, uh, director of Texas and American Life Corpus Christi Center. Uh, he was been, he has been my friend's collaborator when I was in Texas and and I learned so much from him, not only about the research, but about you know, how to collaborate. So I'd like to call him my father in collaborator. I'd like to call him you know, my mother in research. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, my family, my son Josh, and uh, Irene, and my wife, you know, Sun Lin Lee. And uh, we don't have my family, I'm not going to be here, and we need all the support. I uh, truly believe that I can be here. And with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you, Jinhao. Any questions? teaching, um, to research, you know, to, you know, developing collaborations. What was the most difficult of these, and leave out COVID, um, you know, and, and what would you advise to uh, other people, particularly those that might be interested in interdisciplinary research? Oh, that is a tough question. Uh, first thing that comes into my mind, I don't think I'm doing good at this yet, but I've been able to say no to things that came to me and the prioritize, uh, is this in the right thing to do at this moment? And especially when you start a you know, new career as a new faculty, uh, of course you are looking for opportunities. Probably you're gonna you know, hunt for everything, but sometimes you have, may have to be careful what to pursue and what to not. And, uh, being able to say no when you know that you cannot handle you know, that opportunity appropriately so that you can build your reputation. So I think uh, that is going to be the most difficult thing that I'm still learning how to do at this moment. Um, okay. okay, now you are in this part of faculty, but if you were in the faculty, what would you be doing? Like, was there an alternative like when you were going through this journey? So if I rephrase your question, if I start my faculty career again, what would I do differently? No, like, I'm if you were not faculty. Oh, <laughs> if I'm not a faculty, what I do? Yeah, what would you do? I've never you know, thought of any other career <laughs> other than because uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think I even listed this as my teaching statement. Uh, like I said, my father has been, you know, was an elementary school teacher, and he's been kind of my role model that you know, I like to teach. So the sole reason why I decided to pursue PhD is because you know, I like to be in the position where I can teach. So probably if I'm not, didn't get a faculty position in a back, Probably I'm going to be working in some other area, maybe, you know, some, how should I say it? I'll be teaching somewhere else. It may not be the civil engineering geomatics. Probably I may be teaching. I mean, even when I was in college, I was teaching at the private uh, computing schools. I was teaching, you know, how to, you know, do the system of division, all those kind of stuff. So 
probably, I, I think I'm going to be teaching something else, not as a faculty, but uh, I think I have a passion in teaching. Uh, yeah, so I'm an outsider of your research, obviously. When talking about geospatial data science, my first re reaction would be, well, privacy or security concerns, right? So, well, data is collected everywhere. And so, is there anything we need to be aware of or be concerned of as, well, as a non-research area? I don't think I have an answer for your question, but uh, that is becoming a you know, very sensitive topic especially that uh, UAV or you know, drone is uh, becoming more popular uh, platform for collecting this kind of geospatial data. But uh, there's a lot of other you know, privacy information is being shared you know, online because you know, all the satellite images are you know, distributed you know, for free. Of course, you know, there are certain areas that are you know, being masked up for the you know, national security, et cetera. And, um, uh, all I can say is that is it becoming one of the you know topic that you know everybody start to talk about you know how we can um, you know, avoid those you know privacy issues when it comes to this in you know, UAB because it becomes so sensitive problem. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you.